Welcome to the Unstuck Church Podcast, where each week we're exploring what it means to be an unstuck church. Pride can sometimes cause us to think that we won't make the same mistakes that others have made, that we can be the exception to the rule. But often as church leaders, when we don't learn from another's hard lessons, we can end up right in the difficult place that others have been before us. On this week's podcast, Tony and Amy finish our series on stupid church tricks with a rapid fire conversation on some of the more common mistakes they see when working with churches. Before we go there, though, if you're brand new to the podcast, head to theunstuckgroup.com forward slash podcast and subscribe to get the show notes in your email. When you do, you're going to get resources to support each week's episode, including our leader conversation guide. Again, that's theunstuckgroup.com forward slash podcast to subscribe. Now, before this week's conversation, here's Tony. Plain Joe, a Storyland studio, partners with churches, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, and educational environments to create unforgettable strategic, digital, and spatial stories that lift the spirit. Through architecture, branding, interior design, website development, themed environments, and more, Plain Joe champions churches as sacred storytellers and collaborates with a wide range of world-changing people and organizations. To learn more about working with Plain Joe's team of down-to-earth specialist architects, strategists, artists, and problem solvers, visit plainjoestudios.com slash getunstuck. Well, welcome back to all of our listeners. Tony, good to see you. Uh, you've been a little busy these days, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty fun, though. Um, I don't know, Amy, for whatever reason, the beginning of 2023 uh, was just, it was kind of a slow time. And uh, to the point that I was looking for opportunities to get out on the road and to engage with churches. 2024, it's a brand new year because um, <laughs> I my I look, just looked at my calendar and I am scheduled all the way through and past Easter now at this point. So um, it's fun uh, to be engaging with so many great churches in this season. Um, And I Mm -hmm. love it because a lot of these conversations are around the fact that churches are growing again, they're healthy, and they're Mm -hmm. just trying to figure out how how do we continue to take our next steps to carry out the mission God's called us to. So definitely a fun season to be engaged in unstucker work. Yeah, it, that's a fun kind of stuck. I was just talking with the church yesterday, and they're experiencing 40 to 50% growth right now. So wow. something big is happening in Louisiana. Uh, that's right. Fun stuff. And hey, this series has been fun. Are you sort of disappointed that this is our our last podcast in the series on stupid church tricks? And it, it, hopefully, it has... by the way, we haven't offended too many of our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just figure, you know, Amy, if if they've been listening to us all these years and this is the first time they've been uh, offended, um, they really haven't been listening. So um, I, we've done we've <laughs> we tend to sprinkle our offensiveness, if you will, in throughout our conversations in every episode. Don't loop but... me in on that one. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I certainly hope we haven't offended too many people. After all, we've said this before, these aren't stupid church tricks because we think people who do them are stupid. I I haven't met many pastors who are trying to sabotage their churches on purpose. (laughs) Rather, we're calling these tricks stupid because they lead to pain. They lead to problems. They Mm -hmm. lead to dysfunction in churches. And gosh, Amy, they always have. They have. And kind of in other words, if you've been listening to this series and thinking, well, maybe we're the exception, you probably aren't. (laughs) Yeah. Because these have been proven things that have led down roads that we don't want to go down. And so far, Tony, we've talked about stupid church tricks related to leadership, to staffing, complexity, lack of alignment, uh, last week making things louder than the gospel message. So because this was sort of a your idea for a podcast series. How do you want to wrap up our series today? Ah, yeah. So uh, in today's episode, we're going to just cover a lot of miscellaneous stupid church tricks that didn't fit into (laughs) any of those previous categories. So (laughs) buckle up. This should be fun. Uh, We're going to talk about mistakes related to multi-site, to church websites, church buildings, and so on. And my team doesn't uh, let me rapid fire rant publicly very often. So that's what you're going to get today. This is probably the closest that we're going to get to just kind of a rapid fire reaction to some of these topics. 
That's exactly what I was thinking as you started talking. You just want to kind of roll off a bunch of things that are still sitting in your craw. So Sean, um, <laughs> if you're editing this podcast, there might be more editing than usual. And we'll see, Tony, what makes the final cut. Yeah. All right. You, I think you said multi-site. So why don't we start with the stupid church tricks related to multi-site? All right. So the first stupid multi-site church trick is hiring a campus pastor and then letting them teach every message at that new campus. Now, I, I know that this is going to be a slightly controversial opinion, but our team has worked with enough multi-site churches of all shapes and sizes, and we actually just released a multi-site focused research report back in December that confirmed what we've seen. This approach, letting the campus pastors teach all the time, um, that's, that's great for church planting, but it's not so great when it comes to multi-site strategy. Yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of churches make this mistake because, you know, Tony, it sounds good in theory, but what we've seen in this approach, it actually leads to disunity organizationally mm -hmm. when that campus pastor is teaching every Sunday. They become the primary voice, the primary vision caster for that location. So if your intention for multi-site is to remain one united, cohesive church in multiple locations, this isn't the approach that we would recommend. And yeah. after all, the campus pastor role, it's a unique one. It's one of the most important hires you make when you're going multi-site. And the qualities that make a good church planter actually make for a pretty bad campus pastor. Church planters should be strong preachers, visionary, evangelists. And if you put someone with those qualities in a campus pastor role, pretty soon you're going to have an independent campus on your hands. That's right, Amy, and we've seen this firsthand. And the issue of campuses becoming independent also tends to happen when the church makes another common multi-site mistake, and that's focusing on what's different or distinctive at each location rather than what all the locations should have in common. And this is, a again, a, it's a great strategy for church planting, but it's a really bad strategy for multi-site. In multi-site, uh, we want to figure out what do people who are trying to reach have in common. In church planting, uh, instead, we're focused on what's distinctive about the people that we're trying to reach. In multi-site, we have one mission, we have one vision, we have one ministry strategy, and that's the key, one ministry strategy across mm -hmm. all locations. In church planting, it's the same mission, but often uh, there's a different vision that each plant is pursuing and mm -hmm. certainly different strategies to reach people in different communities. So multi-site and church planting can both be super effective strategies for expanding our reach and helping more people find Jesus, but we have to be clear on which approach we're pursuing because they have different outcomes. In multi-site, we're trying to become one church in multiple geographic locations. In church planting, the end goal is multiple healthy churches in mm -hmm. multiple geographic locations. And since you're getting to rant a little bit in today's episode, um, I thought I'd like to take a minute to share some of the common mistakes I see when it comes to staffing in multi-site. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Please do that, Amy. <laughs> this actually comes from a church I just worked with, and we had a good chuckle about it. But you know, primarily in the staffing area with multi-site, the issues I've seen really come down to a lack of willingness to make tough staffing decisions. And by the way, we see this in all kinds of churches, not just multi-site. But in multi-site in particular, we've seen situations where instead of having a hard staffing conversation, the pastor took someone who should have been removed from the team and they move them around. The most common place I see they get moved to is the care pastor. Um, again, instead of addressing the issue, they, they put them in a, a little bit safer role. Or I see them continuously reduce the responsibilities of that person. And by the way, responsibility somebody else has to pick up but they make no salary adjustment. Um, sometimes they recommend them for a job at another church or make them maybe a district superintendent. In some cases, they make them a campus pastor. Yeah. Uh, but I like how Pat Lincioni talks about underperformance in his book, The Ideal Team Player. Um, if someone doesn't have the competency skills to do their assigned job, in other words, if they've got high character and high chemistry on their team, but they just don't have the competency to do their job, Pat calls them a lovable slacker. In other <laughs> words, everyone loves them, but they really aren't contributing to the team. And I think for many pastors, character issues are actually the easier ones for them to move on. 
but they struggle when it's competency. And I, I get it. I've sat in those awkward rooms and been the one to initiate those hard exit conversations. Some of them went well and others didn't. But this ultimately for me becomes an issue of stewardship, right? Stewarding our yeah. financial resources well and how we spend our staffing dollars. And also stewarding the time of the person who's on that team that isn't succeeding in their role. And we just aren't doing them any favors by keeping them around or moving them around or taking any of those unique alternate options I just mentioned. All right. Well, we've harped on our multi-site friends. Uh, that's enough for today. But what are some <laughs> other miscellaneous stupid church tricks that come to mind, Tony? Yeah, here's another one that really stands out to me. When church websites are clearly designed for insiders, meaning the people who are already attending and connected to the church, that, I mean, everything on the website is for mm -hmm. people that are already in the church. So here are a few real life examples of how we've seen this play out. One example, the physical address is not listed on the website. Yeah, this is a real thing. <laughs> really? There have been many times <laughs> where a church has reached out to us to work with them, and we've gone to their website, and we have no idea where the church is located. And so particularly churches <laughs> that are in bigger uh, communities, um, if you're expecting new people to show up on Sunday— I might suggest you put the address someplace on your website. Uh, here's another one, not listing service times on the website. And again, this is something we've seen many churches forget to include. So they talk about all the great things that are happening at their church, um, but people don't know specifically when they were supposed to show up to their church. Um, not mm -hmm. providing contact information on the website. Um, and um, this is, uh, I think it's become more prevalent in recent years, certainly for businesses, but unfortunately we're seeing churches that are doing this as well. So there may be a way for, to email the church. You, some churches have added a chat feature, but I mean, we're in ministry. There are going to be times when somebody needs help. There, there ought That's to be right. a phone number with somebody to call on the other side. And if you can acknowledge up front, when you call this number, this is, this is who is going to pick up the phone and chat with you. That's going to make it a lot easier for people to, to make that call. So that's another one, mm -hmm. not providing uh, clear contact information on the website. And this one, Amy, it, it surprises, surprises me every time. It's amazing how many church websites don't talk about Jesus anywhere on yes. their website. Yes. I mean, I've seen that happen way too many times. I can't think of a church website that I've actually seen that. I was just having a conversation with a fellow ministry leader, and I'm like, y'all need to have a webpage that talks about Jesus. Every church has their their theology, right, what we believe, but so few churches have anything about Jesus. And we've said this before, Tony, you know, the website is the church's front door. This is the one area where it's easy to make small mistakes that have a huge impact. So again, if I'm new to the community or exploring spirituality and your church comes up in my Google search, but I don't know where you meet, when you meet, or what to expect when I get there, I'm either moving on to the next church or maybe just giving up altogether. Exactly. And our goal should be, of course, uh, to make it as easy as possible for new people to visit our church and hear the gospel. So we want to remove every barrier, big or small, that might stop that from happening. And your web, your website, that's a great place to start. And speaking of barriers, Amy, here's another one. Um, I've seen, again, way too many churches build big buildings, big auditoriums, and have parking that's just nowhere near adequate. So as, mm -hmm. as an example, I worked with a church several years ago, brand new 2000 seat auditorium. This is a big church, but brand new two th mm -hmm. 2000 seat auditorium. And they only had 500 parking spots on their property. And we know from the calculations that we've done in the past that for every parking spot, there's only going to be about 1.5 people. So what that means is that 500 um, parking spots will only allow for 750 people in that 2,000 mm -hmm. seat auditorium. In other words, we're building the room too big and we're not thinking about, can we actually accommodate that many people on our mm -hmm. property through parking? All right. So we're going down the math wormhole. So what's next? <laughs> I can see where you, I can yeah. see it in your eyes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So this one, it really does irk me, Amy. And it's probably goes back. It just probably goes back to my days working in public administration. I was a city manager. Um, this has been close to 30 years ago. Now um, I was overseeing a $20 million budget. Uh, and here's the stupid church trick related to this. It's budgeting by faith. Now, should we have faith in Jesus? Absolutely. Should we have faith that God's going to provide resources for us to accomplish the mission he's called us to? Absolutely. But should we be planning to spend 10%, 20% more than we've ever seen come in uh, through giving in our churches? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, there there really are two types of churches when it comes to building and managing a budget. The first group looks at what came in last year, then adds a percentage and hopes and prays that it's going to receive that uh, that bigger amount in the coming year. They view that additional percentage as kind of the faith portion of their budget, and it sounds spiritual, mm -hmm. but it's often quite foolish. The second group, on the other hand, begins to look at what came in last year. However, they then subtract a percentage from what they expect to receive in the coming year. Um, they would argue that the entire budget requires faith. And I consider this the wise approach. And ultimately, churches that are wise with their financial resources create more margin financially. And that allows for more opportunities for generosity, including investment and new kingdom initiatives that the foolish churches will never be able to afford. So when it comes to budgeting, rather than uh, budgeting what came in and then adding a percentage, we should look at what came in and subtract a percentage so that over time we create more financial mar margin and we can accomplish more ministry. That's really good. And that's enough math for today. <laughs> hey, Tony, our, um, <laughs> our podcast series sponsor, um, Plain Joe Studios, which I just learned they actually, my husband just took a new lead pastor role here in the Twin Cities and they worked with our church and did a phenomenal job. Uh, but they serve churches, nonprofits, uh, and more through architecture, branding, interior design, website development. And we asked them, uh, for some of their stupid church tricks, what they see from their seat. So I'll, I'll just roll through a couple of these and see what you think about them. The first thing they said, stupid church trick that they see is initiating major change without the communications rollout plan to properly communicate the why and bring the congregation along. He's, they said, this is a struggle anywhere, but they see this specifically within the churches where they're not building a communications plan. Uh, second, they said, uh, Another mistake is building a massive sanctuary, kind of what you just talked about, that way overestimates growth. Uh, but then their kids' area is too small to support it. So very similar mm -hmm. to the parking lot mistake. Um, next one, spending heavily on state-of-the-art technology that quickly becomes outdated and useless. In other words, choosing flashy over functional. Now, I was a weekend person, so I was all about having good gear, but I was always so thankful to have some reasonableness within our team of playing those decisions forward and making some wise decisions. And then lastly, just launching a major project or campaign without sufficient research into the changing community or future needs. So any thoughts on those, Tony? Yeah, especially that last one. I was just with a church and we were looking at some of the demographic shift that has happened in the church in recent years. And they it just caught them by surprise. Um, they, they weren't aware of how quickly the community was changing. And had mm -hmm. they known that, they probably would have made decisions not only about facilities a little bit differently than they had, uh, but even more specifically, the strategies that they're engaging to accomplish their mission. So it's it's just good to be aware of what's happening in the community around mm -hmm. us, what's happening in our mission field to shape decisions that we're making about the future of our ministries. Yeah, the last one that they shared was along this website that we just talked about. They, they just said, you know, small adjustments that you make to your website can make a huge impact and keep things fresh without breaking the bank. I think the stupid church trick here is sometimes churches drag their feet because they envision we have to revamp and do a huge web redesign. We're really making some of those small adjustments we talked about are going to give a lot of bang for the buck.
Well, this has been an interesting series to say the least. Um, Tony, any final thoughts as we actually wrap up the conversation on stupid church tricks? Well, um, it's been it's been fun. Uh, however, I am really looking forward to what's going to happen as a result of churches really wrestling with some of the topics that we t- talked about over these last several weeks and figuring mm-hmm. out how can, how can we get aligned and continue to be effective and how we're engaged our ministry so that we can help more people meet and follow Jesus. And we did this series because we hope that church leaders who are listening today will be learning uh, from the mistakes of others, and they won't go down these same paths. As leaders, we're called to be good stewards of the limited time and resources that we have available, and that's why we want you to maximize your potential by avoiding some of these crazy ideas that have landed other churches in trouble. And if you do find yourself stuck because of some of these mistakes, um, our team, we would love to walk alongside your church as you seek to get back to a place of health. So you can start that conversation with our team at theunstuckgroup.com. Well, thanks for joining us on this week's podcast. At The Unstuck Group, our goal is to help pastors grow healthy churches by guiding them to align their vision, strategy, team, and action. In everything that we do, our priority is to help churches help people meet and follow Jesus. If there's any way we can serve you and your church, reach out to us today at theunstuckgroup.com. Next week, we're back with another brand new episode. Until then, have a great week.